this portion of tonight's meeting. Are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Uh, I have an adjustment. I'd like to do um, a communications update regarding the building steering committee decisions. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Is there any public comment tonight on our agenda items? Okay. Seeing none, 4.0. Samsung Sol for tomorrow's state finalist, Scott Daigle from the Middle School Technology and Engineering. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, I wanted to talk about the work that some of the kids at the middle school have been doing already. Um, we started earlier on in the semester uh, a a person that works at CASA, which is a group home in, in Scarborough, uh, for people who have pretty significant uh, cognitive and physical disabilities, reached out, saw that I was working in, w with the robotics club with the kids at school, and, and she had an issue, she had a problem where the clients at CASA really, um, for what they're able to do, they had a really hard time with finding things that, that were leisure, fun, enjoyable activities for their clients that weren't geared towards you know, very, very young toddler age um, children. So she was looking for a way and saw that I was part of the robotics club. So she was looking for a way that maybe I could help out and have the kids in the robotics club <coughs> do something that would you know, work through and maybe modify some things that would be more age appropriate for the clients at CASA. And which I, before I was technology and engineering teacher here at the middle school, I, I, I worked in special ed, so I knew their, their staff there. So I was super excited about the, you know, opportunity and went over to meet with the staff at CASA and met some of the clients and really got an idea of what they were looking for and realized that, that the robotics club that meets once a week and we use the Lego robotics kits would be limiting and really difficult to make that type of project work because of the flexibility that would be needed. And I didn't really feel like it would fit well into like the robotics club structure that we have at the middle school. So I checked in with Ms. Neto and asked her, would it be possible if I just grabbed a group of eighth grade students that I thought would be, um, you know, they already enjoy helping out. Some of these students volunteer down in the functional life skills class already as part of reverse mainstreaming groups. So I grabbed, I have a group of about 35 eighth graders that either just love to help people, are great students, or they have like some tech savvy abilities that I've seen in my technology and engineering classroom that they can really bring something to the table and help out the, you know, that type of a project. So I just thought I'd give it a try and I invited close to you know, 35 kids to, to just basically tell them about the project. These are some of the ideas. This is the problem that, that people in your community have and how can we figure out a way to help them? And I had an overwhelming response from the children. They were super excited and motivated to help. Really just fantastic students. So with their really enthusiasm really got me jazzed up to really go forward and try to, to make this project work. And because we had already started to do the work for it, we had met a couple times and we are scheduling uh, next week. We have clients from CASA coming into the middle school to meet with the, with the students that are working on this project. And so the students can really get an idea of the clients that they're trying to help out and some of the, you know, the constraints that they have and some of the limitations and really get a better idea of how to try to solve that problem for them. So we had already started the work with it and I decided that I would really fill out the application for the Samsung, it's a solve for tomorrow contest. 
because we'd already started the work and the kids were super motivated for it and I figured it was a great fit because the contest is really about using STEM and engineering as a way to help your community. So it really fit in perfectly with what we were already doing. So I decided to enter us into the contest and you know, a couple of weeks later we found out that we were state finalists for the contest. So we're up really up to five different schools in Maine or groups in Maine can be recognized as state finalists. So I was super excited and the students are super excited that, that we were recognized as one of those five groups in the state of Maine. And now we're down to, <coughs> excuse me, there were over 2,000 applicants for the contest nationwide and we are now one of 300 schools that um, are, are still in the competition, hoping that um, the next step will be to, from the 300 schools nationwide that are still in, the, <coughs> still in the contest, will be picked to be the state finalists for the state of Maine to represent the state of Maine. And they'll go from one school for every state, plus they'll pick another, fi another 50 at-large bids. So they'll be, from the 300 that are currently still in the contest, we'll go down to 100. And fingers are crossed that we will be you know, chosen but I really feel like, you know, I was just telling my administrators over there that, that the project at this point, I feel like is already a win because of the students' motivation, the students' enthusiasm to make this work. We have a Google Doc and <clears throat> part of our trick is that this is not part of their class. This is all extra. So this is something that they're doing on their own time. We're, we're meeting during lunch meetings. They're coming into my room and trying to get times that they might be able to stay after class. So they're going with their already busy schedules, they're coming in and, and spending extra time to make something like this work and to help people. So I feel like the, we've already like got to a really good place where the kids are, are excited and motivated to try to make this work. And it gives them the opportunity to really use like, to use STEM in a, you know, in the way it should be used, like a re solving real problems, real, real things to help people in the community, which we can't always do with the constraints and the limitations of having them for like a 55 minute class every other day. This really is a open long term project that will really produce some real results for the kids. So I feel like I'm, I'm very excited for it and, and just the way that the kids have, have really jumped on board that we have a shared Google Doc that we're, we're throwing up ideas on because a limited time that we have to meet and they're already like filling it up with ideas, you know, a, a whole bunch of different exciting things. So we're still in the early process and the early stages of it. We're gonna meet the clients and then they're gonna start through the whole engineering process where they have to plan, they have to come up with, um, you know, different things that might possibly work and out of you know the 35 students that we have we're going to have a bunch of different ideas and and go through the process of building things whether we use the 3d printing capabilities that we have in the classroom or the wood shop that i have in, in my classroom or, or the electronics modifications that we can do to make some things for their clients um, we're and really it's all student driven they're coming up with the plans they're coming up with the ideas and we're going to do our best to build something and try to help those, those clients there at CASA and help the community. So. That's great. Do you have a date as to when you find out <coughs> when the next phase is um, being launched? The, I have to submit an action plan, which is the next step. I've, I've done the application and, and gone this far. The next step is for me to submit an action plan that has to be um, by November, uh, December 4th. After that, they vote on all the action plans to decide who would be the state finalist. And I believe that information comes out like in the middle of December, right around like the, I want to say the 14th, 17th time, right around there. The it, It's a little murky in the looking at the contest and the rules, but if as far as I know, if the if we get chosen to be one of the top 100 state finalists, there's um, fifteen thousand dollar prize for the school, and also fifteen hundred dollars worth of video technology. That the next step in the contest, if we do become state finalists, and you know my fingers are crossed, but I am you know 
enthusiastic for the kids. The next step would be to create a three minute video that outlines the project and the work we're doing and then we sub would submit the video <coughs> and out of the 100 videos that they get, they'll select 80 of those schools will get $15,000 for, for equipment for the school. 15 of them will get $50,000 for the school and five of those schools will get $100,000 for the schools. So, so it is, you know, pretty exciting. But I already, I am not like, you know, hitching any wagons for that. I'm excited for the enthusiasm the kids already have and that we might be able to help these, you know, community members at CASA that, that really aren't able to access some of the, you know, the leisure things that most of us all can, so. I, I just want to say that I hope you win. Uh, Thank you, me too. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, other than just the competition, it's um, really great to have you here and so that we have the opportunity to hear what you've been able to do. And, and to me, it's so exciting to hear that you're um, able to have this outreach with the community like that. I mean, it's so incredible to see the, the partnership and for the kids to have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for, you know, for taking that on and thank you to Dr. Neto for, for allowing that to happen. I mean, the, the skills that those kids are gonna have and the experience I think is, it's just incredible. So yeah. thank it's you very an amazing much. experience. It. So thank you for doing that. Yes, thank you. Super exciting, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 5.0, if we could ask Brian Shumway to come up and give an update from Scarborough Education Foundation. Great. Uh, thank you, Leanne. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to re reintroduce the Scarborough Education Foundation to the board and to the greater community. Um, Scarborough Education Foundation is a volunteer board which is focused on enriching the curriculum within the Scarborough schools. Um, we raise money to, to give out grants to educator-initiated uh, education proposals that are innovative, don't really fall within the standard school budget, um, and that tend to be kind of a pilot-type project or a proof-of-concept project. Um, starting this year, we're pretty excited as a board that we're going to be starting to measure the impact of the work that these grants create and you know, start to work with the school department to you know, report that report on an impact and hopefully have some sort of uh, help with uh, inform future education decision making. This year in the uh, fall grant cycle, each year we have a fall and a spring grant cycle, we received 12 applications for grants. Uh, <clears throat> we received them from four of the six schools in the district including the high school, the middle school, Wentworth and Eight Corners. Um, and the grant requests ranged from $342 to $10,000. Um, know, in total, it was a total of, I think, over $40,000 in grant requests. Um, you know, we're starting our major fundraising campaign uh, on Tuesday of this week, or next week. Um, and that will supplement our Operation Graduation Balloon, which I think many of you have seen in the community, uh, where we sell balloons to celebrate the graduation of our seniors. Uh, we've also started doing teacher appreciation gifts, um, and this year we'll be doing it at the, uh, the winter holidays and also at the end of the year. And then the annual appeal, of course, is our biggest fundraiser, which will be kicking off Tuesday. Um, we're proud that our board of directors for the past several years has been 100% participants within this annual appeal and we hope to get you know very strong participation from everybody in the community and everybody in this room that'd be really terrific our goal this year is to raise twenty five thousand uh, dollars which will help fund our spring grants uh, and also help us with our fall grant cycle um, to date Steph has given up has given out over a hundred seventy thousand dollars in grant money to uh, Scarborough educators and we're we're really proud of that so, uh, you know, Leanne, thank you for the opportunity to, to give this update, and uh, I look forward to doing this in the future. I'm so glad that you came in to talk to us. Definitely want to have you come back and give regular updates. And just as a reminder, Giving Tuesday is coming up. Consider giving the donation to SEF. It is an incredible organization. 
and what you give back to this community is huge. So thank you for what you do. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Brian, can, can um, you let the community know how they can make a donation? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can go to our website, which is www.sefmain.org, um, or on Facebook. Um, we're there at Seth Main. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. 6.0, the November Spotlight Award winner. Back to you. Okay. I've never used this before. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this we did just have a spotlight winner um, at our last meeting. That was actually our October spotlight winner. Um, and at this meeting, um, I'd like to introduce you to our November spotlight winner. Um, it's Catherine Hewitt, who is a teacher at Wentworth School. Um, and I think, so I did want to point out that, um, okay, I'll do the video first and then I will point out what I'm going to point out. So, <laughs> um, so you have to, <laughs> Hi, my name is Dina Bowers. I'm an ed tech at Wentworth Intermediate. I nominated Katherine Hewitt for the Spotlight Award due to all of the work and effort that she's put into the garden not only for the school but for the community it's become not just a place for a garden but a place for students to go and learn and take the indoor classroom outside congratulations Catherine great job <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelly Crosby. I'm the principal at Wentworth School, and what can I say about Katherine Hewitt? She has been our garden champion from the beginning. Um, she has really transformed and brought over the aspects of the garden from the old school to our new school, which was a complete blank canvas. It was an area of grass with a chain link fence around it. And to see it now, it is a thriving, amazing, blooming, unbelievable outdoor learning classroom. So it has been her vision to include as many kids as possible in the garden and the work that happens there. And as she says all the time, you can learn anything in a garden. She's really taught me a lot and she's been a gift to our school. So thank you, Catherine. This is the first time this has ever happened, but Mrs. Hewitt was actually nominated by two separate people um, at two separate times. So um, the nomination from Dina Bowers, which is the one that um, we put in here, I, I put as part of our um, video, but I also just wanted to read um, 
a nomination from somebody who's retired now. It's um, Susan Wheel Hackett. Did I say that right? Um, so she nominated Catherine Hewitt as well and said that Catherine has been the guiding light of our school, Wentworth Community Garden. Outside of school, Catherine is a landscape designer and she has brought her considerable talents to our school's garden, which she has designed, implemented with her team of volunteers and students and put in hundreds of hours maintaining. Catherine has helped teachers see the educational potential of our garden space, interweaving the space with science, art, language arts, history, and social studies. She has included teachers around the school in both special projects, such as composting and bird hotel painting, and ongoing horticultural activities. In addition, Catherine has made sure that our harvest is shared with our kitchen and is a frequent cheerleader, bringing flower arrangements to teachers whose days need a bit of brightening. Um, and so I knew that the, the garden shared um, the harvest with the kitchen, and I heard a lot about the pizza sauce that the kids made. It was by far their favorite thing. But um, we are so happy to have you in the district, and thank you so much for everything that you've done. So congratulations, Mrs. Hewitt. Welcome to stay with you, Mike, but if you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Gage to provide an update on the turf field and the track. Please. Um, so where we're at right now is yesterday they did um, two tests. They did what's called a G-Max test, which tests the essentially the bounceability of the turf. And then they also did a, a hit test, which is head impact um, test on the turf as well. And so we're waiting to hear back from those results. And then um, the next stage of that is a core sample test of the track, um, which Public Works will be involved in as well as a outside contractor for that as well so and then once we get those reports back um, we'll reconvene and figure out what next steps are um, we're guessing that there'll have to be some mitigation um, or depending on how the results come back a, a, a plan for the spring for athletics so that's where we're at When, I'm sorry, I might have missed it. When did you say we would have the results back? Uh, I don't know that. Don't know. We're hoping within a week. Okay. Yeah, they'll put a report together, and the two tests give a, give a range. Um, and then um, usually with that comes a recommendation as to what we might be able to do um, if we want to mitigate it or, or not. They will provide a recommendation. I'm guessing because the company that did the testing also provides that service. Okay. We used a third party vendor that we don't um, we don't normally use. It it wasn't the vendor that was selected to put the turf in. It was a different vendor, um, but they also provide renovation to turf fields as part of their service. So I'm guessing that they will probably um, <laughs> make a suggestion on what could be done. But will their recommendation include like the actual safety of what we're dealing with? Um, it, the core, it, once they do the core sample on the, on the track, that will provide a lot of guidance as to, um, you know, what the next steps are with that. If we, the thing with the core sample is if we if we discover that 
it's really um, not worth saving it at all because it's just so deteriorated. Um, that's what we had planned for in the bond issue, to be able to do the whole project. Um, and we'll have to wait and see how that comes back because perhaps they might find that a layer in there, you know, they can stop at a certain level and build back up from there, you know, repair and then build back up from there. Um, so the core sample will tell us that. The turf situation is this, that if a section of it has to be replaced or more rubber added because essentially that would be the mitigation. The mitigation would be we have to add more rubber in certain places. Um, so, it, or if sex, whole sections need to be replaced. The trouble with that at this point is there's so little, there's so little bit of the fiber left that they could put down a new section, for example, but then it would have to be shaved to the level that the other turf is or it be a trip hazard. So there's really never a gain. So it might look nicer, it might be a little bit more green, but um, because they have to shave it to get it to the level of the rest of the turf so there wouldn't be a trip hazard, you're, ne you're never getting ahead. And so at some point in time, it's going to get to that point where, um, and that's why the field now looks so black. You know, if you're looking at it standing back compared to other turf fields, is because of the amount of rubber that's in it to be able to have it pass what they call the GMAX test, the, the, the bounce test. And so the black reflection is the, uh, the uh, enormous amount of rubber that has to be put in it to, to make it playable. Um, and so, We'll just have to wait and see what that test, those test results come back and then make some decisions moving forward. Thank but at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, there, it's going to have to be replaced. I mean, it's no different than a carpet in your home or tires on your vehicle. They just, it just doesn't last forever. And so at the end of the day, it's going to have to be replaced. And because of the cost of it, it's gonna to have to be voted on and replaced by taxpayers. And so, um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not something that can continue to be mitigated. At some point, it's not gonna be playable. Yeah. And then we'd have to be looking at alternatives. And to be honest, I've been doing this a long time and in Scarborough a long time. I don't, I don't see where we would play a football game, for example. I don't know of another place. We can kind of figure out in the spring because of the, uh, of the availability of college facilities because they're out of season. But in the fall, colleges are back in season using their facilities. We just don't have. Um, so at some point in time, it's going to become a, you know, it's a big, bit bigger issue. It's going to continue to snowball. Um, given that this failed at, um, on the ballot and the, as you've articulated the need for it to be replaced in conjunction with the current, current climate uh, of our town, I, uh, I reviewed the board's policy KHB, which authorizes the administration to consider requests for advertising on school grounds on a case-by-case -case basis. And... Um, I'm wondering if that's something that's been discussed or considered. It has. Um, we Where we landed, honestly, is that we would be looking for a major donor. We wouldn't be looking to have 30 donors giving X number of dollars because we also have town ordinances in terms of signage and those things. And so to keep in, to keep in our uh, current situation with our practice as a school department related to posting advertising and also in terms of the amount of advertising um, if we pursued that we'd be pursuing um, a major donor as opposed to um, you know smaller donations is that something that you can try to do um, I don't think that's I think that's something that we'd have to look at moving forward as a group um, 
remember this is not just a school facility it's a town facility so we're we're you know the responsibility of this project has really been on the town side it's not a school it's not a school managed facility we're the largest user of it there's certainly no question of that but um, it's not a ta it's not a school managed facility so um, that would be something that we would all have to be on board with so there's been some initial discussions about that but um, there's been no uh, person going to ask Hannaford for a million dollars if that's what you're asking so ultimately it would be a group decision between the town and the school I'm going to guess that okay the superintendent was in on those meetings so perhaps he has um, some more info than than that but I'm thinking that I from my perspective sitting on the meeting I think it would have to be that's a larger conversation I think okay. that's going to take a an effort and so I think that's a larger conversation having having been involved with nonprofits and done a lot of that type of work <laughs> in my past experiences those those are not a next day activities those are those are long-term activities to develop those relationships to look to a business for a large donation. It takes time. I don't know that we have that level of time on that turf if we want to continue to play on it. So, so after serving on the board for a year, I have to say that since the vote and since the fail of this particular bond issue, I have been stopped more in my neighborhood by every range of person from I've had kids to stop me walking the dog. I've had a couple of grandparents approach me. And, and I've tried to explain kind of some of what I think is some of the miscommunication about this issue. And I know you've talked about it at length, but I wanted to take this moment to kind of say and share the analogy that I came up with. And you can tell me if I'm right or not before I say it anymore. Um, and that is that let's, and this is what I've literally said on my street, let's say you're driving a 13-year-old car that you've used very, you've taken care of but you've used it and it's worn out and you're ready to replace it and you're looking for funding and you're probably gonna replace it next year and then you hit a deer and you choose to fix that car and you fix the car and now the car is fixed and looks just like it did before you hit the deer but it's still a 13 year old car it still needs to be replaced and we still have to pay to replace it and so I've used that analogy when talking to people because I think there's a, a good portion of our community that thinks that the damage that was done to our field is what has led us to this point of having mm -hmm. to replace it. And the argument is, well, why should we pay for it as taxpayers? These kids or these, this family should pay for it. And my reaction has been the damage is paid for and done. It's been fixed. It's right back to the level of usability it was before. And now we're faced with the same situation we were before this damage happened. And so I, I share that analogy with everyone because I think that it's important that we understand as a community exactly what we voted on. It's, it's not the first time that I think we may have turned something down because of a lack of information. We had that issue last year with the Sebago Alliance. And um, now we're at a situation where we have something that's necessary for safety. It's necessary for our athletic programs and our community programs. And a clarification of that communication, I think, is really important. Um, so I, I know it came up last night at the town council meeting um, with public comment. And it's something I'm sure we're going to talk about many times again. Um, but I just want to take a moment to share on camera and with everybody here that I think it's so important that we clarify that message and take the damage that was done out of the narrative for why we're searching for this new turf. I think that, I mean, my opinion is I think that that's a wonderful analogy and it's very accurate. And we've been talking about the turf replacement for a number of years, as you know, because I've mentioned the chronology of it several times, that that turf was installed in 2006. It had an eight-year warranty. Um, it's well past its useful usefulness. Um, and it's, like, like you said, that is a great analogy or the cars on your tire wear out. I mean, things just have to be replaced. Turf fields are not forever. Um, and so grass fields aren't forever. Grass fields have to be replaced from time to time too. So um, nothing's really forever. And I think moving forward, it's important for everybody to understand. I'm a taxpayer in this community as well. And I think it's important for everybody to understand in this community that um, when we make those types of investments, you also have to think about um, at, at the point in time where you have to reinvest in it. And so we've had a great useful years out of it for very little money following um, the initial outlay, and it's time. 
The unfortunate part is we're on the other end of what everybody else is, where everybody else is putting in turf fields now, where we were the first ones in southern Maine. We had a turf field before colleges had a turf field in our area. And so we're on the other end of that now, while everybody else is installing really nice fields and they look beautiful and nobody's really worrying about any maintenance. We're on the other side of that because we were the first ones through the, through the door. So I have also had a bunch of people approach me about this. Um, and one thing that I'm still kind of lacking clarity on is who, who really this, whose shoulders this really lands on now. So obviously, because we're the biggest users of the turf and the track, this has the greatest impact on us. But I'm kind of left looking at people saying, well, I'm, I'm not sure what role the board has in this, if any. Or I'm not sure what role the athletic director or the school department or the superintendent has at this point. And so you had said, you know, in response to one of Alicia's questions, that it would be kind of a group decision. Where, where, where is the conversation kind of sitting right now? And like, whose, whose plate is this on? Well, the conversation, the last conversation we had included the town manager and the superintendent and myself and the assistant superintendent and um, the community service director. And we began to kind of strategize about what next steps might be. And we felt that the first next step was testing of the, of the, um, of the, of the facility, which we avoided that testing because we thought it was an undue expense given the fact that we felt the bond was going to pass, so why would we spend that money when we're going to, you know, fix it? And so um, it was decided that the money needed to be spent to see where we're at to get that foundational information to be able to move forward. But the town pays for that, so at the end of the day, it's a, at the end of the, whoops. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's a town um, facility, so. Um, I don't know. Am I talking to this? <laughs> At the end of the day, anyways, it's a town town facility. I don't know what role we'll play except to be um, except to be a partner and help out in any way that we can. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. Yep. Mike, when was the last time that testing? <laughs> that me? Okay. I don't think so. I think I broke it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I fixed it. <laughs> when was the last time? I remember um, in, a, in another update you had said that, like, the bounce test or whatever, it yeah. wasn't good, but it wasn't unplayable. When yeah. was the last time that the field was tested? I think it was two years ago. We, oh. We've had it tested regularly. It's not something that's required every single year, but it is something that's required over time, and as the field gets older, it's suggested the suggested time the time between checks diminishes. So um, as it gets older, you, you, the recommendation is to have it checked more often. But I believe the last time we had it checked was two years ago. I don't know that we did the HIT test, the head impact test, but we did the GMAX test um, a few years ago. If you recall, perhaps you recall, um, there was a lot of talk about it at the time. We added a substantial amount of rubber um, to the to the turf, and it was that year that we had done that GMAX test and realized realized we needed to add that much. It, it was a it was a substantial expense, and it's and, and so um, it went to the town council and and I don't recall the year that was, but that was when we had the test done because we realized at that point we had to add that rubber, and it was I don't know like three tons of rubber that was added. It was substantial. I think two tons are in my mud right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was substantial. Might have to add some more. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, eight point oh, motion to go into executive session pursuant to one MRSA four hundred five sixty for the purpose of discussing the appointment of the assistant superintendent to return to public session. So moved. Second. All those in favor. Excellent. We will be back.
remember. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, moving into new business, 9.1, our appointments, 9.1.1. Okay, I would just like to uh, remind the board and the public that uh, this fall we've been very busy with advertising with the assistant superintendent's job, and certainly we wish Joanne well, and we'll miss her. <laughs> Thank God we have you till the end of the year yeah. or thereabouts. Um, but really what we've tried to do is put a committee together Monique and Allison have been instrumental with trying to set a process up to make sure that we get some wonderful candidates. And I'm pleased to say that we had a slew of people apply for that position. And we interviewed and interviewed, and uh, I think we came up with a strong candidate. I'm very excited about this candidate. And if I could, I'll just read my announcement. And. So this is for the Assistant Superintendent of Scarborough. Dr. Diane Nato is nominated to fill this position created by a retirement. Dr. Nato earned her master's degree in literacy, received a certificate of advanced study, and this past May uh, obtained her doctorate in public policy in the educational leadership program, all from the University of Southern Maine. Dr. Nato brings with her 16 years of administrative experience at both the elementary and middle school levels. For the last two school years, she has been the principal at Scarborough Middle School, where she has been instrumental in developing and implementing many creative and innovative programs for staff and students that have helped them thrive and grow. I'm most pleased to nominate Dr. Diane Nato for the position of Assistant Superintendent of Scarborough Schools. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. In discussion. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so pleased at, at the selection of the committee and um, the middle school has really benefited under your leadership and um, you've demonstrated uh, such an ability and I, I just think it's been such a, it's such a great choice and I'm so excited for you and, and for Scarborough. Thank you. I'm really excited to get to start working with you. Mm -hmm. um, hearing and seeing everything that's happened in the middle school, I cannot wait to see where you bring the district. So congratulations and welcome aboard. I will simply say that through uh, the experience of the last year, I, I thoroughly appreciate and drawn to people in education who can balance professionalism with humor. And so I look forward to more of that, and congratulations. <laughs> All those in favor? Congratulations, Dr. Nadeau. I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there anything that you wanted to say? I just want to take a minute to thank all of you for this awesome opportunity. I have absolutely loved the past two and a half years in Scarborough, and I feel very honored to be in this role um, and to work with the amazing staff that we have here. We have an unbelievable team, and it's just going to be great to continue this work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Diane. Congratulations. 9.1.2, acceptance of the Jim Danny's instructors as presented. So moved. Second. Second. Oh, <laughs> Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Unanimous, fantastic. I'd like to take 9.2, which is the meeting minutes of October 22nd workshop. 9.3, meeting minutes of October 22nd business meeting and 9.4, the meeting minutes of November 7th, as one motion to approve as written. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Excellent. Okay. 9.5 is the motion to approve the superintendent's contract, and I'm also gonna read this. Hiring a superintendent is one of the most important responsibilities of any school board. 
The board, outs, the board set out specifically to hire an experienced superintendent and we're happy to have Sandy Prince join our team as the interim superintendent. He has quietly made himself an integral part of our district by attending various functions, events, and open houses without a lot of fanfare, but just to participate and observe. He is leading by example and are allowing our schools to consistently operate in a positive manner. LD 1220 became effective on September 19th and the enactment of this new law removed the previous restrictions related to compensation and requisite years of service retirees returning to fill open positions in education. These changes are a win for districts all over the state who can benefit from hiring experienced leaders. This new law required us to renegotiate our current contract with Mr. Prince. During these negotiations, it became apparent that we had a unique opportunity to not only maintain stability in our district by retaining our key leader, Mr. Prince, but also to provide support and mentorship for our newer assistant superintendent by one of the most experienced superintendents in the state of Maine. This is the best possible scenario for Scarborough students and staff while providing normalcy and consistency. I request we make the following motion to remove the term interim from his title and extend Superintendent Prince's contract through June 2021. So moved. Second. And discussion. I'm just gonna say Sandy, thank you. Thank you. Um, what you have brought us has been phenomenal. Um, I learn from you every single day. I'm certain if I'm getting that in the small amounts that we actually get to interact, the folks who work with you daily must be getting so much as well. And thank you for agreeing to stay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All those in favor? Unanimous. small we're going to see how well my eyes do on this one um standing committees based on the elections we have realigned some committees um the first one did not realign you guys were incredibly successful um, in passing that the budget last year and again looking at stability sarah thank you for remaining as the chair and working with april and Alicia in what may be the most important function of any board in passing a budget Negotiations, Hillary, thank you for taking that on as chair, working with Nick and Sarah. Um, just as a reminder, Amy will be retaining as the lead for our teacher's contract. Um, policy, Alicia will be chairing that with April and I. Your balance and understanding of the laws and how to put that into word and making sure that we're covering our students at every turn. Thank you so much for taking that, Alicia. Outreach and Communications Task Team. April will be chairing that committee with Hillary and Kristen. Again, bringing, making sure that we are communicating everything that we're doing um, really well and engaging with all of the other committees to share everything that's happening. Long Range Facilities, Nick is retaining that as the chair, working with Sarah and Hillary. Curriculum Committee, Kristen will be chairing this um, along with Nick and Sarah. A long-term assignment, our building steering committee. Hillary and Alicia are working with an incredible staff of community members and administrators on this. Um, I have a feeling this is gonna be an incredibly long committee assignment, so thank you guys. And um, frequent. And frequent. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the hours that you've already put in are incredible. And then liaison roles. Nick will be working on our legislative end. April will retain with the CTE and the paths on a vocational side. PEPG, Nick will be taking that. Town Council, April will retain that as well. Community Center Committee, um, Sarah and I will retain that. Our term got a little extended um, last week. We're gonna hope that we'll see that kind of end, not mid-December, but... End of January. End of January, maybe beginning of February. Um, Health Safety and Advisory, Alicia will remain on that committee. The Comprehensive Needs Assessment, April, thank you for agreeing to stay on that. Dropout Prevention, Sarah will retain that position as Every well. Every student graduates, yeah. Oh, hey, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, district Communications, thanks Hillary. Um, 
it made sense to keep you there continuing the work. Community business partnership, Sarah, thank you for taking that. Uh, K-12 professional development redesign is Kristen. Transportation bus safety, which is actually a lot of fun if you can go on one of those trips. Um, Kristen, really? I, <laughs> I only agreed to give that up because I found out that I can still go if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. And the pre-K task force, um, this is getting more and more news. And Kristen, thank you for taking this and reinvigorating the conversation so that we're prepared <coughs> should things change and we find legislation that, yes, we're taking our pre-Ks. All right. Motion to accept the uh, committee assignments as read. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Oh, you're going to go back to uh, 9.7. You had a handout for the Finance Committee resolution. Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to read through this whole thing, um, but I will just cover off the important bit. So over the last couple of months, we've been giving you guys updates as to the work that we've been doing with, as part of the Joint Finance Committee. and coming up with some new goals and objectives for this coming budget uh, development cycle. Um, and there's really two main changes that we're recommending. And this is a non-action item. The purpose of this resolution is really just to be a recommendation from the past joint finance committees to the new joint finance committees, or finance committees in our case, saying the same. Um, but I believe we'll see some changes on the town side. So it's really just to recommend that we continue the work that we're already doing. Um, so the two main changes that as a result of last year uh, that we want to recommend are to actually define what uh, the goal is for first reading and second reading. So last year, if you recall, there was an overall goal of a 3%, no more than 3% increase. Um, there was confusion as to whether or not the, there was an expectation of that to be met at first reading or second reading. So we've cleared that up. We've said that at the first reading, actually, that we're going to have a separate metric, and at second reading is when we, we collectively need to hit that 3%. Um, mill rate or less. So at first reading, what we're going to, what we're recommending is that we actually introduce a second metric, which is the net budget increase um, expense. And so if you, you have on the form just sort of what it's been in the past um, five, five or so years, there's been a range of, um, I think on the school side, it, between 4.86 and a 6.2% increase. Um, so it's our uh, recommendation that the um, the net budget expenditure for the school is less than 6%. And that's where we'll start from. And then from the town, it's no more than, um, I think we said 3%. does not exceed 3%. So we'll, the hope is we'll come together with the finance committee of the town at our first joint finance meetings. We'll uh, commit to keeping these as goals and then focus on some other things. Um, we'll get this posted with the agenda so people can read it. But any questions? No, I think this is great because I don't want to have the confusion that we had last year mm -hmm. again. I think that was detrimental to all the people that work so hard on the budget and the community in general. Um, and I like the idea of um, making a differentiation between the mill rate and the actual budget increase, because I think that's really confusing for people too. So um, the fact that our goal is going to be the actual budget increase, which is something we can control, as opposed to the mill rate, which is something we really can't control as easy, less control, less over, control yeah. over, I think is um, is going to be, it's only going to be positive for everybody. So thank you for doing this. Yes, thank you so much. You guys have anything you want to add? No. no. Thank you, great. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Nine point eight, which is the update regarding the building steering committee. So I I just added this to the agenda um, because not because there needs to be any um, action taken, but because I just wanted to have a discussion and keep everybody up to date on or looped in on what the timeline looks like for um, the building steering committee and the. Um, their recommendations to the board. Is there is there any way that we can fix the slide or adjust or is that on purpose? I don't know why that's there. 
And it's just beautiful. <laughs> Sarah will do I don't know if we were trying to be like, oh, just kidding. We, this is a surprise. <laughs> no, it's, I don't know why. It's really good. We okay. have a millennial. Yeah. Thank, you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, um, so the building steering committee has been working for um, a while now. We've been meeting weekly. Um, we've been doing hour and a half, two hour, two and a half hour meetings. Um, there's a ton of work to be done. They have, um, or we have our own milestone timeline, um, and all of that's going to be shared with the board. But I wanted to um, talk about what the board's role is um, and how that timeline is going to work. So this is separate. This, this isn't information from the building steering committee. This is just um, when we got together in communications and talked about how this would look if you put it out, you know, kind of drew it out. Um, I, I tend to draw things out, so I put it here as like a little timeline. Um, on December 5th, and this is this date has been out for a while, we're going to be having a workshop, so that's um, before our business meeting. It'll be at 6 o'clock. Um, and, and at that time, the building steering committee will have a presentation for the board. It'll have um, a lot of the information that we've gathered and um, used to make our recommendation. It will have the recommendation that the building steering committee would like to offer, and then it will have some next steps that would be suggested. Um, at that time, that's just kind of a time for you. You can ask questions, absorb that information, um, and then, oh shoot, I did the wrong date. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I can change it on mine, but it won't show it up there. Um, so then the next meeting is December. I did all the wrong days. Sorry. So the next meeting is December 19th. That's the one on the bottom. Um, I'd like to, we'd like to suggest that that is a public hearing right now. It's just a regular business meeting, but um, we'd like to suggest changing that to be a public hearing um, on the primary school space. So um, the information from the workshop should be up and on our website. Um, <clears throat> members of the community will have a couple weeks from to look that over they can email the building steering committee or the board and ask any questions and then that date would be a public hearing so that we can get some input from community members then that's the wrong day too January 2nd which is the third um, little bubble it's a square a rectangle um, <laughs> <laughs> that is going to be a board meeting um, at which we will take a vote on whether we would like to accept the recommendation from the building committee. We talked a little bit about outreach for how we can get these dates and this information out to the community. Um, we will we'll probably do, these are just like spitballing ideas, I just put them up here so you had an idea of what we were thinking of. Um, we'll probably do a direct email to all of our, to our district um, list serve. And we'll put stuff out on social media, and we and we we'll, we will consider doing like a quarter page of ad in the leader just to put the dates out there, um, and and information on where to find information. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there and and have a discussion. Like I said, it's not an action item that we need to do anything on, but um, if anyone has any questions, ideas, or discussion that uh, we want to talk about, it was just kind of a, an introduction. I know it's a little bit quick. Do you guys have anything to add? Communications. Just said I think we need to obviously update these and then get somehow get this out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. oh. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to try to update it. Now. Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> no, no one saw that one. Obviously, that's not working. That's why you shouldn't touch computers. Um, but no, we really think that having the um, public hearing in place of a workshop on the 19th is a really good idea. That will allow folks a chance to come in and um, talk with us. If we need to extend beyond that one hour period of the workshop, we can keep our meeting short on the 19th so that we can accommodate that, so that we can hear from as many people as possible. Um, I'd also like to include council in that conversation so that they can have some engagement with us um, as we go through the process of hearing what the community is sharing for their feedback. I will make sure that I get that, uh, the appropriate dates and information to the town council. No Fantastic. problem. Thank you. Um, one thing that I wanted to add was um, in preparation for the December 5th workshop, 
um, one thing we had talked about at communications committee and I just kind of wanted to make sure that this was um, a more formal request was I think that one thing that would be really helpful would be if the building steering committee were to put together a one pager um, that we could distribute and so part of our communication strategy is to do some physical print um, materials whether we put them at the primary schools or the library or town hall um, and that I really feel like that document needs to be created by the building steering committee um, and so I would I would like to request that something like that be prepared so that we can distribute that. Yeah, right. we can. Alicia and I will bring it up at our meeting on right. Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Um, so you're going to put out a direct email, you said, I think, Hillary, to the school community. Yep. And there's going to be a leader ad that will go out to the general community. Is there any way to get to more of the general public other than the school committee to, to inform them of the of the public hearing date and, and if you have ideas let us know I mean honestly because we, we actually talked about this at our um, roundtable discussion last week <coughs> which is you know we have, we have a lot of ways and avenues of getting information out to people but it always seems like there's somebody who says oh, oh well I don't go on social media or get an email or look at the leader and honestly like we are open to any ideas that anyone has to get information out there, not just for this, for anything. Um, but right now, these are kind of our three. So basically, we, we use the district email, the distribution list that we have for the entire district to get information out. That does get a, a really wide population of people, but it obviously doesn't get anyone who doesn't have students in the schools. Um, we put it on social media. Hopefully, some people follow us that don't have students in the schools. And so the other choice, the other um, idea we had was to do the leader ad because we were hoping to get some people that um, don't have kids in the schools or maybe aren't in tune with some of the stuff that's going on um, but if you have other ideas for for a way of of um, getting information out to those folks we'd be like really happy to hear. what what does the town use for communication the, yeah, that's a good question the, and yeah. And I'm, and I'm happy to reach out to Larissa and talk to her. She has the town newsletter, which she puts out on the uh, bi-weekly. Okay. Um, and then they also have a different distribution list, and we talked about this also at Roundtable. Um, so they have a different email blast you know, distribution list than we do. Um, and so that's certainly an avenue that we that, can that, that would we be can great ask if, them. If yeah. you could do that. And when I say social media, we generally ask like things like this. We will ask the town to share, share. our okay. posts. So that is that is part of the social media too. Thank you. Can I ask a question about your timeline? Yeah. That's yeah. up there. Between the public hearing and the date that we vote, mm -hmm. is the steering committee gonna have the opportunity to go back and adjust or tweak any of their recommendation that they're making? Based so on what they're hearing from the public probably my guess is probably not because the steering committee's um, job was to is to look at the information that we have and not necessarily like the, okay. that's our I think the board's job is to think about the community okay. impact um, but the building steering committee their their uh, charge was to look at the information we have mm -hmm. um, and the data that we have and make a recommendation I, I can't guarantee it wouldn't change, but... Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just hard to know because I don't know how detailed their recommendation is going to be, I guess. It's, um, it's a... I mean, it's going to be a bunch... It's going to be a long slideshow of yeah. a lot of data. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would just say procedurally, my interpretation would be that we, we will get a recommendation from the Building Steering Committee in the workshop then we'll have the opportunity to process that information. We'll hold the public hearing, which will give the community an opportunity to weigh in on that information. And, and ultimately, it's the board's decision to vote on how to move forward. And so we kind of, even though we're taking the two pieces separately, the building steering committee was not charged with taking the community's okay. input okay. into case. That, that's, so that's, that's just that's our yeah. Thank you for putting the timeline together. I think it's helpful. Well, can I just, with that being said, though, I think the information that the Building Steering Committee gives to the board is going to be very important information for the community to also have. So there is that little bit of crossover, of like the one pager, the Building Steering Committee will make that and it will be distributed um, 
but sorry, I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, that said, thank you again for putting this together. I think having a timeline so that not only for the board to keep in mind important dates for us to manage to, but really to start getting this out to the community um, because you guys are working on an incredibly tight timeline to make this decision, and it's an important decision to make. All right. Any other discussion? All right. Oh, and. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is a season of doubt. Um, congratulations, <laughs> Joanne. Um, I s heard about this today as well, and what an incredible recognition of your work with Junior Achievement. Um, Joanne received a national award today. She is only the fourth person in the state of Maine who has ever received this. Um, her long-standing support of this program is phenomenal. And it just really speaks to who you are as a person. So thank you for that. And congratulations on your very well-deserved. Thank you. I was very surprised. As I said this morning at the meeting, I was really shocked because I thought I was going for, you know, a little goodbye, Joanne, you know, your retirement. And, so on. and um, um but as I told them, I was a business major, and a, my, my, my major was business, and my minor was education. I've always believed in financial literacy. Even when I taught me eighth grade math, it was, I always did the stock market and so forth. As a matter of fact, I think Peter Michaud has talked to me several times about the stock he wished he had bought in my class. <laughs> but um, it's not just the kids that they've impacted. It's a lot of teachers who have gone from you know, education as themselves through college and then come back into the classroom, they never have had the experience of working in the business world. And having someone from the business world come in and work with them has impacted teachers as long, uh, along with the kids who are in the classroom. So I really believe in the work that Junior Achievement has done in the state. And um, I think last year we served 125,000 kids. So. They've done some incredible things and have. And Diane is now also on the state board um, for Junior Achievement. Oh, you are? Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Um, just a couple quick reminders. Oak Hill players, if you have not seen Peter Pan, go do it. Do yourself a favor. It is incredible. Incredible. The talent that these students have, um, it's awe-inspiring. So. And then next Thursday is our community dinner. Um, so if folks have free time, if they want to have a meal at, with the community, um, this is open. Please do um, RSVP on the website if possible, just so that there's an accurate headcount. Um, but congratulations to everybody who has been working so hard to put this together because it looks to be one heck of a turnout again this year. And because this is going to kick off prior to our next meeting, the high school is having their art show. Um, it starts December 2nd in the Learning Commons. Um, I've always been impressed with the art that comes out of the high school. Please go, go check this out and you know, support our students and the amazing work that they do. And then one last plug, um, please do donate to the SEF organization. Um, it would be incredibly powerful, specifically coming from the board, if we could go back and when they apply for grants or when they're doing any plugs for themselves, to say they have 100% support from us as members as well. Um, Giving Tuesday, go donate, please. All right, and with that, motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor. Thank you all very much. Nice to meet you.